Well, good evening, everyone, or good morning, or good afternoon. Um, I'm Suzanne Inewi, Marketing Manager at AUC Press and Bookstores. Uh, I would like to welcome you for tonight's event, the virtual book talk with Dr. Bob Breyer. Um, we're going to start the event. Uh, I'm going to introduce Dr. Bob Breyer briefly, and then I'm going to leave the floor to Dr. Breyer to discuss um, his latest the publication, The Luxor Obelisk and its Voyage to Paris. Then we're going to open the floor for some Q&A. Uh, overall, the event is expected to last for about an hour. Um, if you have questions, please type them in, in the Q&A box so we don't miss them. And also for our followers on uh, the Facebook page, uh, the event is broadcasted there. If you have uh, any questions, you can type them in the comment section and we're going to send them here to Dr. Bry or read them uh, aloud. Um, OK, great. Uh, Dr. Bob Breyer. Uh, is recognized as one of the world's foremost Egyptologists. As a senior research fellow at the CW Post campus of Long Island University, he conducts pioneering research in mummification practices and has investigated some of the world's most famous mummies, including King Tutankhamun, Vladimir Lenin, Ramses the Great, Eva Peron, Marquis Tai, and the Medici family of Renaissance Italy. In 1994, Dr. Breyer became the first person in 2000 years to mummify a human cadaver using the exact techniques of the ancient Egyptians. This research was the subject of a National Geographic TV special titled Mr. Mummy, and I watched it myself <laughs> back in university. Yeah, impressive. He was the host of several award-winning television specials for TLC, including Pyramids, Mummies and Tombs, uh, Mummy Detective, and more recently National Geographic TV presented his research in a documentary called Secrets of the Great Pyramid discussing a new theory of how the Great Pyramid of Giza was built. Uh, Dr. Breyer's research has been featured in such in many uh, media venues such as CNN, 60 Minutes, and the New York Times. And we're lucky tonight that we're gonna have him discussing um, his latest translation of the Luxor Obelisk and his Voyage to Paris, which discusses the uh, extraordinary story of how an obelisk from the banks of Luxor was transferred to the Place de la Concorde in Paris. And this was uh, all done by the uh, young French engineer Apollinaire Lebas, a man of uh, extraordinary resolve and ability. So I'm going to leave the floor now to Dr. Breyer. Thanks, Suzanne. Okay. Um, if we could have this first slide up, is that possible? The, uh, the first image, and we'll do it. Let's see, there it is. OK, looks good, looks good to me. Let's see, looks, looks fine. Um, okay, so what I'd like to do is tell the story of Apollinaire Labat. You know, it's really not my book. It's not my story. It's Apollinaire Labat's book. He's a, a remarkable man. Now, let me just see if I can, if I can advance. Um, I'm not advancing. It's, yeah, that you, you advance it, Suzanne? Okay, fine. Um, for most people, when you think of building in ancient Egypt, the greatest achievement is the Great Pyramid of Giza. It's the only one of the seven wonders of the ancient world that's still standing pretty much intact. But for me, even more remarkable are the obelisks. Next slide, please. Now, all of the obelisks in Egypt, let me, let me give you a little background on the obelisks. They're all made of pink granite and they all come from the same quarry at Aswan and they're all made out of a single piece of stone. Now, it's a remarkable achievement because when the obelisks were being quarried, the Egyptians only had copper and later bronze tools and that's not hard enough to quarry pink granite. So how'd they do it? Next, please. You can see here, they were quarrying an obelisk and you can see the outlines of the obelisk in the quarry, but I think you can see all the little square indentations on the obelisk. And that's because they didn't use chisels, they pounded it out with this kind of rock called dolerite. It's a dolerite pounder, it weighs about 16 pounds, and the only way to get an obelisk out of a quarry is to pound it out with these rocks going boom, boom, boom. Now, a while ago, Mark Lehner, a really wonderful Egyptologist, tried it. He wanted to see how long does it take to get a, an obelisk out of a quarry. And using a pounder, the, it, it makes an indentation of about a quarter of an inch every hour. Right? So it takes forever. But that's how they did it. Next slide, please, Suzanne. Yeah, here you can see a trench that they're digging down on the side of an obelisk. And these would have been men, I think, going shoulder to shoulder. They were probably prisoners, that's my bet, um, because there was an expression in ancient Egypt, he was sent to the granite. 
it wasn't an easy job by any means. So these guys probably were shoulder to shoulder, dropping their pounders, and maybe there was an overseer who would be clapping or rhythming them when to drop the pounders. And of course, it's a, it's a dangerous thing also because you get all this granite in your lungs that you get mononosilicosis. So it's not an easy job, but this is how they pounded out these obelisks. Next, please. Yeah, and I'm showing you here, how did they get the bottom free? Well, the way to do it is you take your pounder and you pound horizontally. And you pound till you get a little tunnel underneath your obelisk. Once you have this little rectangular tunnel, you stick a granite block under it to support it and you dig another tunnel next to it. So eventually after you've dug four, five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 tunnels, you put blocks under it, the obelisk is resting on these blocks and that's how you free it from the bottom. Not an easy task at any means. Um, next please, Suzanne. Yeah, and this shows you what it looks like when you're almost finished, but there's a long way to go on this obelisk. Next please. This to me is the most amazing undertaking, undertaking the Egyptians ever tried. It's the unfinished obelisk at Aswan. It would have been the largest obelisk ever quarried by a lot. It weighs a thousand tons. Now a thousand tons is more than three times any other obelisk ever quarried. It's just immense. And I think you can see where it is. It's right in the middle of the quarry. On either side, they've dug the trenches down, giving you the rough shape of the obelisk. They've smoothed the top and then it cracked. You can see it at the top where the crack begins. This is one of those moments where, you know, somebody says, no, you tell the Pharaoh, no, you tell the Pharaoh. Um, so it was abandoned in the quarry, but it's one of those remarkable things where we really don't know how they're gonna move it because it weighs a thousand tons. You would need many thousands of men on the ropes pulling it if you're gonna move it. And we just don't, don't know how they would have done it. Next slide, please. This shows you the tip of it, and you can still see some of the pounding marks there. Next, please. The only clue we have as to how they were gonna move it is this scene in a tomb, it's a Middle Kingdom tomb, of a man named Jehudi Hotep. And what it shows is a statue of him being moved to his, in front of his tomb. Now, you can see the statue on the left, it's on a sled. Now this statue weighs about 34 tons, right? We're not talking a thousand tons like the obelisk, only 34 tons. But we have 172 men pulling on ropes. And I think you can even see in the front of the sled, there's a man who's standing right by the foot of the statue and he's pouring a liquid in front of the sled. That's to lubricate it. And on the lap, I think you can see on, on Jehudi Hotep's lap, there's a man standing and he's actually clapping. He's rhythming the men when to pull. And it's, it's an interesting scene because if you look on the lower left-hand side, you'll see that there are a couple of guys carrying a plank, a long, a long piece of wood in case the sled breaks, they've got a spare part. And in front of that, you've got three guys carrying water for the, for the pullers, you know? So it was a big deal to pull this thing. And he put it on his tomb wall so he could show you, look what a great thing I did. And this weighs only 34 tons. I mean, if, if you had a thousand tons, imagine how many people you'd have pulling on the ropes. It just doesn't seem to work, but somehow they thought they were gonna do it. Next slide, please. The only actual contemporary account we have of moving obelisks is at Queen Hatshepsut's mortuary temple at Deir el Bahri. On one of the terraces, she put on the wall how her obelisk were moved to Karnak Temple. And what it shows, and this is remarkable, it shows two obelisks on the same barge. They're bottom to bottom, and the two tips are on the right and the left. And this, these two obelisks were put on the barge and were towed to Karnak Temple on the Nile by 23 boats. You had 23 boats pulling this barge to Karnak Temple. And Hatshepsut was very proud of this. You know, this is one of her great achievements. And even on the pedestal of one of the obelisks, she said she quarried it in 70 days, right? So it gives you an idea of how she did it. Anyway, that's seven months, I'm sorry, seven months. Now, how did they lower the, how, did, how are you gonna raise this obelisk? Well, again, the Egyptians didn't leave us an account. They never told us how they raised the obelisks. So the best we can figure out is, now obelisks always came in pairs. 
They're put in front of the temple and they don't have interesting inscriptions on them, just the Pharaoh's name and that kind of thing. But the way we think they were raised is they had a sandbank. They would make a sandbank as high, you know, as high as the obelisk, pull the obelisk up on top of the sand, and then they would lower the obelisk down the slope onto the pedestal. That's what you're looking at at the top. They're lowering it down the funnel onto the pedestal. And then in the second scene on the bottom, they have ropes on it and they're pulling it upright. And that's the best guess we have about how they raised obelisks. Now, one of the things that always amazes me and, and the reason I think obelisks are even better than pyramids is that the obelisks are not pinned to their base. They are simply balanced. They are so perfectly crafted that they, the center of gravity is in the geometric center. So you get it upright once and it's not going anywhere. So they pulled it up and just rested it on the pedestal. And that's how we think they raised the obelisks. Next, please. The largest obelisk standing today is not in Egypt. It's in the Vatican. It's the Vatican obelisk, and it's about 105 feet, right? It's a, it's a very big piece of stone. And this is the only obelisk. Actually, if you could, if you could go one more slide, please. Let's go to the next slide. I'll show you. Yeah. Um, maybe go back. I'm sorry, Suzanne. Let's, let's go back to the, uh, yeah. Um, this is the only obelisk that was allowed to remain standing during the Middle Ages. Now, Rome had several dozen obelisks. The Romans thought obelisks were fabulous and they brought them back to Rome as trophies of war and erected them at their circuses. You'd have the chariot races around them and things like that. Now, the Romans, like the Egyptians, didn't leave us any account of how they moved obelisks. We just don't know. But when the Christians came in, they thought obelisks are pagan, right? And they should be torn down. So the Christians tore down all the obelisks of Rome, except this one, the Vatican obelisk. Now, the reason they left it standing was that when St. Peter was martyred in the circus of Caligula, right? St. Peter is martyred. He is crucified. And he says, if you remember in, in the Bible, he says, crucify me upside down so I won't be mistaken for our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's crucified upside down. And when he was crucified, this obelisk that we're looking at was standing in the circus and it was a witness to the martyrdom of St. Peter. So for that reason, when the Christians are tearing down all of these pagan obelisks, they allowed this one to stand, this one to stand because it had witnessed the martyrdom of St. Peter. So that's why this one remained upright. But it too had to be moved. You'll see in a minute, but I'll get to that in just a minute. Now could I have the next slide, please, Suzanne? Yeah. Now we're getting close to my story of Apollonia Laba. There were two obelisks standing in Alexandria. Right? Was actually one is standing and one is fallen. The, the one that's fallen fell probably during the Middle Ages. And these are two obelisks that are going to be moved but not by Laba, you'll see. Next, please. Next slide. Yeah. The reason I translated this book by Laba with my colleague, back one, back one. If you can go back one, Suzanne, yeah. I did this book called Cleopatra's Needle several years ago. It's about the three obelisks that left Egypt in the 19th century. One left for London, 1879, one left for New York, 1881, and one left for Paris. And the one that left for Paris was a story that nobody knew about. I was really fascinated by this one. It's the first one moved in the 19th century. 1831 is when it starts being moved. And that's the story of Apollonia Laba. As I read my research for this book, I read the story of Apollonia Laba and I said, gee, this guy is amazing. The story is incredible. Nobody knows about it. It should be translated. So I did a, a, a translation of it. And when I finished the translation, I intended to publish it. I realized, well, I'm not a native French speaker. You know, I, I really better get somebody who knows what she's doing. So I fortunately had a friend, Colette Sumner, who's a professor of Romance languages, a native speaker. And I said, Colette, can we work together on this? And so we went over my translation and she corrected it. So we have a pretty good translation now. We're really happy with it. But that's the story of how Apollonia Laba's book came to be translated. But let me tell you the story. Next, please. Next slide, please, if you can. Yeah. 
Now, this is showing us the London obelisk being transported. The time is 1879. The idea for the London obelisk was to put it in a caisson, like a, uh, a cigar tube, you know, the fancy cigars come in these metal tubes. And this is one from Alexandria. This is the one from Alexandria that was lying down. And they put it in this cigar tube-like thing and towed it across the Mediterranean to London, right? They hit a terrible gale, a real storm. And I think you can see on top of the caisson, there's a, a guy holding a sign saying, you can go faster. He's communicating with a steamship that's pulling it. So it's being towed to England and they hit this terrible storm. Now on this caisson, inside this tube that holds the obelisk are five sailors who are controlling this caisson, helping, helping keep it stable. When they hit the gale, they had to cut the obelisk free. They were afraid it was gonna sink. And you have five guys on this obelisk that have to be rescued. So from the steamship, in the middle of a storm, five brave men are lowered in a rowboat and are rowing their way to this caisson to remove the men from it. Just as they get near it, a huge wave comes and swamps their rowboat and they are never seen again. Five brave men lost their lives trying to save these guys. Eventually they were saved. Next slide, please. So this is the, the obelisk on its side being abandoned after the guys have gotten off the caisson and the steamship goes off to London. This is the London news showing you what happened. And, and they, they say they lost their obelisk. They had to cut it free and they sort it sent, thought it sank. The steamship went back the next day just to see if they could find it. They couldn't, so it was gone. So they went home. But then the next day, another ship came along and found the obelisk. It was still floating and they towed it back to England. Now, according to the laws of salvage, they owned the obelisk. So England had to buy it back from this, this ship and they bought it back. And this is where it is today on the Thames embankment, right? And if you wanna go see it, you take the tube to the, the station that's called embankment. And that's how you can see it. Now walk to the back of it. You, there's a, it doesn't look like it, but there's steps and you can go around the back. And on the back, are the names of the five brave men who lost their lives trying to save their colleagues. And when I go there, I often take students there. Um, we go to the back and there's an ancient Egyptian saying, to say the name of the dead is to make them live again. So we always read the names of the five men. So it's, it's a thing worth doing. If you go there, read their names, it'll, 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 it'll do something. Next slide, please. So that's the London obelisk. Now, the New York obelisk is also a story that's fairly well known. This is it as it was in 1881, when Lieutenant Gorringe is going to take this obelisk to New York. Next slide, please. They've encased the obelisk in wood. You've got the obligatory flag flying from the top and they're going to lower it. Next slide, please. Now they're lowering it on this thing that's called a, a it, it, it's called a trunnel. Um, and what it is, is they're going to pivot the obelisk and the obelisk is going to go to horizontal. Now, in case a cable snaps, they have all of those crates stacked up, the wooden crates stacked up so that if the cable breaks, it won't hit the ground and break. It'll hit these crates and stay in the horizontal, which is exactly what happened. A cable broke and these crates stacked up saved it. Next slide, please. Then they took a ship the Dessoug, and they opened it up and rolled the obelisk in on cannonballs, closed the ship and sailed off to America with their obelisk. Next slide, please. They, they, now the obelisk was offloaded on the Hudson River and it had to make its way into Central Park where it was going to be erected. And they built this trestle, it's like a railroad trestle to keep it flat. And I think you can see that on the left, they've got a steam engine and the steam engine is winching the obelisk along on this trestle till it gets to Central Park. Next, please. And there it is today in Central Park. Um, I think you can see it's resting on its original pedestal. Of all the obelisks that were moved, only the New York one 
has its original pedestal. Now, the reason for that is, is, is a, a strange and wacky uh, story. Lieutenant Gorringe, who moved it, was a Mason, right? He was a member of the Masonic Order, Order of Masons. And when he started clearing the base of the obelisk, he found Mason's tools like trowels, plumb bobs, things like that. And he thought it was his ancient Masonic brothers communicating from the past, and he felt he had to bring the pedestal home. So he brought the pedestal with the obelisk. He wasn't asked to do that, but it was a 50 ton pedestal. So it was quite a thing. So now we have the pedestal and the original obelisk. Um, next slide, please. Is it moving? Yeah. Now we get to Apollonaire Le Bas finally. Okay. Apollonaire Le Bas, he was entrusted, well, first, how did, how did France get its obelisk? The answer is it was legitimately taken. The obelisks were given to France by Muhammad Ali, the ruler, in 1831. Not only did Muhammad Ali give them an obelisk, he gave them three. The French were given three obelisks, both obelisks in front of Luxor Temple. And this is a drawing of the obelisks as they were in 1800, done by Vivant Denon, who was with Napoleon's soldiers. So you can see there are two obelisks right in front of Luxor Temple, and they're covered up, they're not, they're not fully exposed. There's another 12 or 13 feet down that had to be removed. So France has given both of these obelisks, both, and either one at Alexandria. They have their choice, right? They can have all three, any one, what are they gonna do? Well, the first thing the French did was send a ship to take the one at Alexandria, to take one from Alexandria. But when the ship arrived, they didn't have enough wood to put a scaffolding around it to lower it. So the ship went home without an obelisk. So France is given three obelisks, but they don't have one. The next step is to bring one of the Luxor ones home. Now, why Luxor? It's a lot easier to take one home from Alexandria. It's by the water. This one, you'll have to bring up the Nile. Well, the answer is that the obelisks at Luxor are the most beautiful of the ones in Egypt. And, Champ and Champollion had been there and he saw the obelisk and he told the French, if you can get any obelisk, get the ones at Luxor, they're wonderful. In particular, take the one at the right because it's not cracked. The one on the left is cracked. So Champollion said, take the obelisk. So Le Bas, 33 year old engineer, a graduate of the Ecole Polytechnique is given the job of go and get us an obelisk, maybe two. If both will fit in the ship, bring both back. That was crazy, couldn't happen. But Lebeau was a bit, bit, bit fortunate. He was allowed to build his own ship. It was, a, it was an interesting, next slide, please. I'll show you. Next slide. Yeah, that's the ship. Now the ship had to have special properties. It had to go across the Mediterranean, but it also had to go on the Nile. So it couldn't have a deep draft, but it had to be sort of ocean going. So they built this special ship, which had five keels, and it was going to go across the Mediterranean, sail it, and then it was gonna go up the Nile to Luxor to pick up its obelisk. And that is the ship. The ship was so large, by the way, when, you know, in those days, 1831, people didn't take large ships up the Nile. No, nobody had ever seen a ship like this at Luxor. And when it arrived at Luxor, the locals, now Luxor, you know, we all know Luxor is a big thriving tourist destination now, but during these days, 1831, the population of Luxor was about 900 people. That was it. And when they saw this ship coming, they called it a mosque on water. Right? They, the only big thing they'd ever seen like that was a mosque. So that's, it was a floating mosque. That's how they viewed it. Now, Labas plan was to run the ship aground, to intentionally run it right up to the, to the bank and get it stuck there so that it'll be stable when they put the obelisk on it. But first he has to go to Cairo. Um, he's getting, and he has a meeting with Muhammad Ali first in Alexandria. Muhammad Ali makes a bit of a joke about Laba's height. He's very short. I think he's less than five feet tall because Muhammad Ali pretends not to see him. He says, where's this engineer who's gonna move the obelisk? Where's the engineer? Laba takes it in good stride and they become friends. They get along well, he and Muhammad Ali. And Muhammad Ali says, I'll give you any assistance you need to take your obelisk. 
Um, and he sends him to a guy in Cairo whose name is Karali Pasha. Now, Karali Pasha is in charge of the maritime in Egypt. And he meets with Laba and he says to him, you know, the obelisk on the right, the one towards the Nile that you're going to take, the one on the west, has a big crack in it. And Labat doesn't believe him because the great Champollion had told him it's in perfect condition. But Karali says, nope, it's got a big crack in it. So all the while, Labat is traveling south to Luxor. He's wondering, does the obelisk have a crack? Does the obelisk have a crack? When he finally gets to Luxor, he rushes across the, the sand to see this obelisk. And sure enough, it has a really big crack. And he's wondering, how could my Champollion has made such a mistake? But he did. So he's really worried. But he has brought with him a stonemason who takes a large sledgehammer and bangs on the obelisk to listen to the sound to see if it's strong enough, if the crack is going through it or not. And he says, nope, the obelisk is OK. If you lower it slowly, it won't crack. But you have to lower it very slowly. So Laba is a bit encouraged. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. His plan, this is from his book, and this is the diagram of how he's going to do it, right? He's going to put ropes on the obelisk. He's got wooden planking on it, and he's got capstans, winches. He's going to have men with winches turning, just like on a ship. He's used to those, and they're going to winch it down and he's gonna restrain it with other ropes on the left side and gently, 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 they're gonna lower it to the ground. This is his diagram. And indeed, that's what he did. Now, before he could get this thing going though, he had to clear away a lot of debris. As I showed you, there were 12 foot of, of dirt and debris on the obelisk. And he had to clear away houses of the locals who had built their houses right up against the obelisk. So he called everybody together. And he bought their houses at a reasonable price. He wanted to do this. And then a woman came up to him and said, you know, I'm blind. I can't help you move the obelisk. But if you hire me with your other workmen, I will pray for you and it will be a success. And Laba hired her. He was a good man who wanted to do the right thing. So he hires all these workmen to clear the, clear the debris from the obelisk. And he hires them to, to build a scaffolding. He's got his own carpenters, but they're going to help. They build a scaffolding. And then disaster strikes. Cholera hits Egypt. He's got his men in Luxor. And a ship comes saying, the Nile is closed. There's cholera in Cairo. But soon the cholera hits Luxor. Many of his men are in the hospital. Quite a few of his men, it's, it's his own hospital. He's, he's created a hospital. Quite a few of his workers die. But eventually it's better and they get back to work. But the problem is because the Nile is closed, he can't get all the wood he needs to build a slipway to get it to the ship. He can lower it, he's got enough wood to lower it, but how's he gonna get it to the ship? Next slide, please. This is another drawing of lowering the obelisk. And you can see they've got the French flag going there. Next, please. Now, I want to contrast what Apollonaire Labat does with a previous moving of the obelisk to show you how good Labat was. The only obelisk moved before Labat was a couple hundred years earlier in 1584. And that is the St. Peter obelisk, the one at the Vatican. But it wasn't always at the Vatican. Originally, as I said, it stood in the Circus of Caligula about a quarter of a mile away. And because it witnessed the martyrdom of St. Peter, it was allowed to remain standing. And in the background of this obelisk, right behind it, is the original St. Peter's Basilica. Well, when the new St. Peter was being built, Pope Sixtus V wanted this obelisk moved to the new St. Peter's. And what he did was he put out the job for bids. He had architects from all over the world come, and he wanted them to say how they were going to move it. And then a committee would pick which plan was the best. And what we're looking at is all the plans of the various architects. Some, some really wanted to move it upright. They were afraid if you turned it, maybe it would break. They were afraid. Um, the great Michelangelo was asked to move it by the Pope. He refused. He said, 
And what if it breaks? So it was a really scary thing to move this obelisk. But one man, Domenico Fontana, came up with a plan that involved lowering it. And if you look in the upper left-hand corner of this engraving, you will see Domenico Fontana's plan being borne away on the wings of angels. He claimed it was a divine inspiration. And what he did was he built what he called his castello, this big scaffolding, a castle around it, and the obelisk was going to be lowered through that. Next, please. That's the obelisk surrounded by the castello, and they are going to lower the obelisk. And I think you can see there are men with winches in the lower left at the very bottom of that engraving. You can see men who are turning a winch and they've opened up a hole in St. Peter's Basilica on the left because when the obelisk pivots, it's going to go into St. Peter's Basilica. On the top of this engraving are all the pulleys that Fontana needed to take down the obelisk. And on the right side, I think you can see guys pulling on, pulling on ropes there, some are in the air, it's kind of almost comical. But Fontana, you know, this moving of the obelisk in 1584 is sometimes called the greatest engineering triumph of the Renaissance. I must admit, I disagree. In a sense, Fontana didn't know what he was doing. Now, what I mean by that is he, he was successful, but he couldn't calculate forces on ropes. He had no idea how, much, how many capstans he would need. So he created more than he needed. He overbuilt, he did overkill. Next slide, please, I'll show you. This is the scene of what it looked like when Fontana was going to move his obelisk, lower it. He has a hundred winches, a hundred capstans with horses, men, it was mayhem. And he didn't need a hundred, but he had no way of calculating. So he just threw manpower at it and hoped for the best. In a sense, he didn't know what he was doing. And that's why my man, Apollo Nail Bar, I think is far superior, but you'll see in a minute. But anyway, next slide, please. That's what Labai used. This is the few, just look at that. He only used ten, a total of 10 capstans. Fontana used a hundred and Labar just diagrams it here. He, could, he was the first man, as I said, he was a graduate of the Ecole Polytechnique, the technical school of engineering for France, the best in France. And he is the first man to move an obelisk who can do calculations like friction on the pulleys, forces generated by, by winches, so he knew exactly what he needed and didn't overbuild. It was an elegant thing. And he got the obelisk down in 45 minutes. Next, please. That's the obelisk going down again. Next, please. He made some discoveries. Once the obelisk was off its base, he could see the top of the pedestal, the top of the base. And as you can see, the base was cracked right down the middle. And what he found were ancient Egyptian butterfly cramps, which repaired it. In other words, they're put in there, they're wooden blocks. You cut out a little butterfly shape like that at M and N, and then you put in a piece of wood so it can't move apart. But the big discovery was that on the top of the base, there carved was the name of Ramses the Great, whose obelisk it was. Ramses had made a practice of carving out previous pharaoh's names and replacing it with his own. That's why we often call him Ramses the Great Chiseler. Ramses would carve out another pharaoh, replace it with his own, and he knew that that might happen to him. So he put his name in a place where no one could carve it out because the obelisk was resting right on top of it and they'd never see it, never be able to move the obelisk. So Laba discovers this, these two cartouches on the base of the obelisk where Ramses had put them. Next, please. Now he's got to get the obelisk from its site at Luxor. He's lowered it all the way to the ship, a little more than half a mile. Now, the problem was he didn't have enough wood to create a slipway so you don't have friction. So what he did was he took the wood from the casing and made a little, a little, a little roadway and he would have his winches, they would move the obelisk about 20 feet. Then he'd take the back of the, of, the, of the slipway, move it to the front, put it together, winch it again another 30 feet, 
take the back, move it. And they kept it moving slowly, 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 all the way to the ship. Next, please. This is what the ship looked like while it was waiting for the obelisk. I think you can see it looks more like a hill. Laban was afraid that the hot Luxor sun would crack the wood of the ship. So he covered it with reed matting and earth and paid men to water it every day like a plant so that the wood would stay moist and supple. And that's what the ship looked like until they put it on, on, the, on, on, the, on, on board. Um, next, please. Now, Laba had to wait about five months for the Nile to rise before they could float the ship with the obelisk. So he went off on a journey, a big adventure. He went south. Now, most people in those days did not go south of Luxor. It was quite an adventure. There was no tourism. There were no hotels. There was nothing. So Laban took some of his men, his officers, and they went south all the way to Abu Simbel. And this is one of the drawings of, of Abu Simbel, the great temple of Ramses the Great, who erected the obelisk. And that's, you know, the guy who erected the obelisk of Laban was really interested. They spent several days there copying inscriptions and having a great time there. Now, one interesting thing happens to Monument. Next, next slide, please. The dancing girls. Now, these ladies were, were dancing troupe that would travel through Egypt, entertaining in coffee houses. They were called the Gawazis. And while Laba was in Egypt, he sort of did an anthropological study. He studied all kinds of things. He studied the mosque, he did, and he wrote it up. But one of the things that impressed him the most are these dancing girls. While he was there, he saw what he what was known and still known today. It's, it's known the dance of the bee. Now it's an early version of a striptease. The young dancer is dancing to the accompaniment of a drummer, perhaps a flutist, and she's dancing. And then she pretends she's being attacked by a bee. So she keeps slapping her shoulder and moving away from the bee. And eventually the bee gets under her shawl and she throws the shawl away on the ground. And then the bee gets under her shirt. She takes that off and she throws that away. So eventually she's taking off all her garments. And then finally, when she's practically naked, she faints on the ground. And one of the accompanists covers her with, with a cloth, with a blanket. And that's the end of the dance of the bee. Now, Apollonaire Labar was absolutely fascinated with this. He writes and writes and writes all about the dance of the bee and how graceful the dancer is and how wonderful she is and how skilled she is. And I find it interesting that the captain of his ship also wrote his own account of the dance of the bee. And he wrote for pages and pages about it, about how it's far superior to European ballet and how this is this and this is that. But they really were blown away by the dance of the bee. But they're, they're only human. Next, please. So Laban waits for the Nile to rise. They return to Luxor. They wait for the Nile to rise. And then they are going to have their ship towed by a steamship. Now, this is 1832 now, or 1333. This is the first steamship in the French Navy. And they are towing this steamship. This steamship is towing this Luxor all the way to France, to Toulon is the port. And they get there. There's a storm, as you expect, there it is. But they, they, they brave the storm and they are about to erect this obelisk. Now, it took them a year to erect the obelisk after it arrived. Now, the reason is twofold. One is that the obelisk had to go on the Seine, the River Seine, and it's tidal. So they had to wait for the rise of the Seine. But the other reason is they hadn't decided where to put the obelisk. It was a committee decision. So they finally define, decide the Place de la Concorde, and then they have to quarry the granite for the pedestal. In a, in, a, in a French quarry. So they're waiting and waiting and waiting for the quarry, for the Seine to rise, to decide where it goes. But finally, on October 25th, 1836, it's erected, but it wasn't easy. Labat had an other plan. Now Labat was given the job of bringing the obelisk back to France, but he hadn't yet been given the job of raising it. That was gonna be someone else maybe. He didn't know. But when he arrived in France, they said, you've done such a great job. It's such a wonderful thing. Why don't you erect it also? So he had a wonderful idea. Labat, a graduate of the Ecole Polytechnique, is a techie. He wants to do everything high tech. And he decided 
that he is going to use a steam engine to raise the obelisk. And he thinks, wouldn't it be wonderful? And he says this in his book, wouldn't it be wonderful to see the obelisk rising silently, effortlessly, without any human intervention, just this steam engine raising it. So he gets a boiler, a steam engine, but the boiler was defective. It was insufficient to raise the obelisk. He tried it a few days earlier. So he decides to go back to the old method he'd used to take it down. He used capstans. And this is a scene with 250,000 Parisians crowding into the Place de la Concorde to see the obelisk raised on its pedestal. The king was also watching. Next, please. This is a painting, a contemporary painting of the obelisk being erected. And I think you can see in the foreground at the bottom, there are people selling things in stands. It was, it was a very festive occasion and the obelisk is up right now. And there it stands in the Place de la Concorde today. Next, please. A medal was struck. The king, Louis Philippe I, king of the French, struck a medal. And on the medal, he names Apollinaire Le Bas. He says it's, it's, it was raised by the efforts of Monsieur Apollinaire Le Bas, engineer of the Marine, a Marine engineer. So a great honor for Le Bas, a great, great honor. Next, please. Today, if you visit the obelisk in the Place de la Concorde, you will see on the base, they have put in gold the mechanism that Le Bas used for erecting the obelisk at the Place de la Concorde. It's a, it's a really beautiful thing to see. There, I think if we have one more slide, please. You can visit Apollinaire Le Bas' grave. He's, he's buried in Paris, right? Um, and you can see on the top of his uh, monument, there's an obelisk, Le Bas, right? He's at Père Lachaise, the famous, the famous French cemetery. And I often go there. Whenever I'm in Paris, I will, I will go and visit Le Bas' grave. And one last slide, please. I think we have a, a, the only image of Le Bas we have. One, please. This was when Le Bas died. Um, they, 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 they had an announcement in the newspaper. And this is a drawing of Apollinaire Le Bas, who became the curator of the Musée, Musée de la Maritime in, in, in France. And, and Le Bas is really one of my favorite people. He was a good man who did good things. And he is the first person ever to be able to do the calculations. When he published his book, at the end, he put an appendix. He was very proud of the calculations. This was science. This was high tech. So he has all the calculations he used for the friction on the ropes, the power generated by the capstans, all of it. And Lebas, you know, really, really thought this was a great achievement. And it was, it was. So he really is the first man to move an obelisk who knew what he was doing. And that's Apollinaire Lebas. Thank you. I think that's the, I think that's the last slide, right? Let's see if it is. Yep. So I hope I've left time for questions. Had a question, yeah. Um... Go ahead. From Harley's uh, saying, did Hatshepsut order the unfinished obelisk? Do we know why and where it was going? Ah, good question. It is generally said that Hatshepsut ordered the unfinished obelisk. We don't really know if that's true. There's no inscription on the unfinished obelisk. There's no inscription of Hatshepsut that says she quarried a big one. Um, so we really don't know for sure. Many people think it's of the 18th dynasty, maybe, um, and it looks like it's fi fine quality as her obelisks were but we don't know for sure that it's Hatshepsut. And we don't know where it's going. That's a very good question. Uh, we don't even know, for example, was it gonna be a pair? Were they gonna quarry another one and have two in front of a temple? We just don't know. It's a one of. Okay. Um, do you know how Leba got the obelisk from Toulon to Paris? Ah, from Toulon to Paris. Um, yeah, it was by inland waterways. They, 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 they floated it and, and towed it. We have a question from James Leba. <laughs> James Next Leba time is you're a in Paris, can you, yeah, can you ch chin up the obelisk and bring me back a rubbing? <laughs> <laughs> Can't do that. Uh, Deborah is asking who built the Alexandria obelisks? Oh, the Alexandria obelisks were Tutmosis III. They have an interesting story. Um, the Alexandria obelisks originally stood at Heliopolis right, just outside of Cairo by the airport. Um, they stood at, at Heliopolis, but they were toppled by the Persians, fell down. And then later they were brought by the Romans to Alexandria to stand in front of the Caesarean, the, the, a, a temple dedicated to Julius Caesar. 
So the Romans moved them from Heliopolis to Alexandria, but they were Tutmosis III who erected them originally. We have a question from Carl. Uh, just got back from a cruise in Egypt and enjoyed it much more thanks to your 48 lectures <laughs> and the history of annual courses on heritage. Thanks. <laughs> Oh, thank you. I'm um, glad have, you enjoyed it. Uh, David Pepper is asking, one Egyptologist, not sure who, said that the granite had a fire built on it, water poured on it, and then a pounder was used, much faster quarrying. Have you heard that? No, I've never heard that, and I'm pretty sure it's not right. I don't think you would start a fire on the obelisk because it would crack rather than, rather than you know, make it softer. I think they just pounded. I think that's really how it did. Yeah. Uh, someone's asking, Libby, uh, she's asking, are there any conversations about turning this to Egypt as with other artifacts? Good, a good question. You know, I, I gave a talk at, at Nemec, the new museum of Egyptian civilization, and someone asked that question also, because um, I think I may have mentioned at, at Nemec that of all the obelisks that I would like to see returned is the obelisk of Luxor, because then you'd have the pair together in front of the temple and it'd be wonderful. Um, there really are no serious conversations about returning the obelisks. Now, the reason for that is that the obelisks are legal, meaning they were given to foreign governments, New York, Paris, and London. So they were given by, by Egypt. So there's no really legal grounds to claim them back. So I don't think we'll ever see the obelisk going back. Um, other, other artifacts, maybe, you know, like the Dender Zodiac, for example, or even the Rosetta Stone could go back because they might not be legal. But I don't think the, I'll, I'll tell you something I, I said at the Nemec talk that people were shocked, I think. Up until 1984, the remaining obelisk at Luxor, the one that's still standing, the one on the left side, on the east side of the temple, that was still owned by France up until 1984 because it had been given to them and they never gave it back. So they still had the right to it. But in 1984, they conceded it back to, to Egypt. So Egypt now owns the Luxor obelisk, but for more than a hundred years, they didn't own it even. It was just there waiting to be taken by the French. Okay, we have many questions coming in. Uh, Murat Chokat is asking, do you think that with, the, with today's tech that the obelisk could be moved faster and as a whole than the French? You know, it's, it's, it's a very good question. You know, we were talking about that before. How would you move the obelisk today? Um, I'm not sure. I, I, think, I think it could be moved faster. I think it could be. But I think what's interesting is I think everybody would be afraid to move it. You know, you, would, will it break when we turn it? Will we do this? Will we do that? So I, I think it could be moved. You know, with modern engineering techniques, it, it might be easier. But I think everybody would be very cautious before they moved an obelisk. Okay. A question. Um, Deborah is asking why you refer to them all as Cleopatra's needles. Oh, why are they referred to as Cleopatra's needles? Yeah, it doesn't really have much to do with Cleopatra, to tell you the truth. Um, they just became called that. I mean, Cleopatra never erected an obelisk, as far as we know, and she was Greek. Um, so, really, it's just a thing that people started calling her. That's all. Okay, uh, Claudia is asking, can you expand on the pounding method? Okay, yeah, I'll try. So you start pounding and you've got these guys shoulder to shoulder pounding and they're going deeper and deeper into a trench. They're creating a trench on three sides of the obelisk. So soon, not, not so soon, a quarter of an inch every hour, as you descend, you're freeing the obelisk from the quarry. But the problem is when you get down to the bottom, to the side of the obelisk, you now have to free it from the bottom. And how do you do that? Well, I think you have these pounders, as I was showing, where I was holding a pounder and pushing it horizontally to pound underneath the obelisk. I think they may have even had it on a string, like a pendulum hitting underneath, boom, 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 as it keeps going. And I think that's may maybe how they did it. And then you get a tunnel, as I said a little rectangular tunnel. So now you have one tunnel. So you take a granite block and slide it in there so it's pretty much filled in. And then you make another tunnel. You make another tunnel, another tunnel. So eventually you have it on these blocks and then you can pound away the remaining part of the granite and you've got your whole obelisk resting on these blocks. Now the problem is in the quarry, how do you move it out of the quarry? Are you gonna chop away 
the whole quarry so that it's on ground level and you can slide it down? I don't know. We just don't know how they were going to get it out of the quarry. For example, one good Egyptologist, really good, Engelbach, he thought they were going to take it out with levers, that they're going to have huge levers and lever it up. But I don't think so, because you didn't have wood big enough. And where are, you, where are the men going to stand to raise a thousand ton obelisk? We just don't know how they were going to move it. I mean, it was a heroic thing for the Egyptians to think about it, but I'm not sure they even would have succeeded. I don't know how they would have done it. You know, it's, it's easy to think the Egyptians were heroic. They did fabulous things like build the pyramids, but they didn't always succeed. There are, there are pyramids that collapsed in the desert. There are, there are tragedies. So I don't know if they would have succeeded with the unfinished obelisks. Okay, um, I was asking, uh, would you tell us about the meaning of the obelisk of the form itself? Uh, and someone form. else also is asking, yeah, yeah. if they were uh, used as tuning forks. Uh, no, they weren't used as tuning forks. The Egyptians didn't know about that. Um, you know, the, the word obelisk comes from the Greek, obeliskus. It means a shish kebab skewer, like a meat skewer, like for shish kebab. When, they, when the Greeks came into Egypt and they saw these tall pointy things, they said, oh, it's like a meat skewer. So that's where the word comes from in, you know, as we use it today. But the Arabic for it is masala, which is a needle, right? We call it a needle, um, masala. Um, but the Egyptians called it techen, techen, that was their word for obelisk. Um, but I don't think it was used as a tuning fork. I think it did have religious significance, however. The idea is, I think that at the top of every obelisk is a pyramid, a little pyramidian and it greets the sun. So I think they are in a sense monuments to the sun. And that's what I think it is. And even the pyramid shape, you have the rays of the sun coming down. So I think that's the significance of it, but not, not vibrations and tuning forks, no. Did it have any religious significance? Someone yeah, I think just the religious significance is the idea it's a sun solar monument, but the inscriptions do not say anything interesting. You know, on all the obelisk, all it gives you is the five names of the Pharaoh, and I built this monument, that kind of thing, but nothing really significant, no. I'll tell you one thing about Hatshepsut though, on Hatshepsut's obelisk, again, just her names, nothing, nothing crucial, but on the pedestal, on the base, she has a wonderful inscription where she talks about quarrying it in seven months to a pair of obelisk, says they were gleaming from the other side of the Nile, you could see them, but she says, as she knew that she as a woman Pharaoh might have her name erased. And she said on the base, say not that I did this, rather say how like her to make this for her father Amun. So she knew that people would deny that Hatshepsut had done this. And she said, don't say that, say rather how like her. So she was an early women's liver. Uh, how did they get, the, the, Vatican they get the Vatican obelisk from Egypt to Rome? Oh, from Egypt to Rome. Nice question. Um, as I said, the Romans didn't, didn't give us any clues. Um, they took it by ship, there's no doubt about that, because we know from, a, from, a, from an inscription, a Roman inscription, that the ship that brought the obelisk, one of the, one of the obelisks, they had two dozen obelisks in, in Rome, that the ship that brought one of the obelisks was put on display because it was such a great big ship. Um, it was on display, um, but, but they didn't tell us how they did it. Um, I think, you know, it's interesting because the Romans obviously didn't think much of it. They had a couple of dozen obelisks that they took and they, they erected them. Eventually they, they fell down and got lost under the streets of Rome. But, but I think, you know, they, they just didn't tell us how they did it, which is a shame. Yeah, someone was just asking about how many obelisks were destroyed in the Middle Ages in Europe. And I think you just answered that. Yeah, I think it's about two dozen were, you know, most of the obelisks that, that, that were brought to Rome as I say, disappeared beneath the mud streets of Rome, the, the dirt streets of Rome. And when Sixtus V, Pope Sixtus V, who was a kind of antiquarian, he was interested in old things, he wanted these obelisks found and re-erected. So you had men going through Rome with iron bars, poking them into the ground to see what, where, where they hit something hard, and then they would excavate and find an obelisk, but often they'd be broken. So they'd have to put them back together again. So today there are, there are 13 obelisks in Rome that are upright, um, and they're from the ones that the Romans brought over. There might be more under the streets of Rome that haven't been found. Okay, uh, Guisita is asking, I might have missed something. Ramesses' cartouches at the basement were under his own obelisk 
uh, was it under his own obelisk? Yes. Or no, it was under his own yeah. obelisk, and he just wanted to make sure on the obelisk somebody could come along and erase his name. But under the obelisk, nobody's going to know his name was there, and it would remain forever. At least that's what he thought. So it was under his own obelisk. Another question. Uh, has there ever been any kind of survey of the Nile bed for obelisks that did not survive transport? That's Would a such very, a very... search be feasible? Yeah, it's a very, very good question. Um, a lot of us Egyptologists have often talked about that. Um, you know, there must have been obelisks lost in the Nile. Um, the answer is no, there hasn't been a search for them. And I think it would be a very, very interesting thing to do with sonar. You just drag it along the Nile on your ship and you see what's there. Um, I think it's a, a really interesting thing to do. Okay, uh, Holly is asking, am I correct that Hatshepsut's tomb says that her two obelisks were done in eight months? Is that right? It seems so fast. Yeah, seven months. It's not the tomb. It's not the tomb. Hatshepsut's tomb doesn't have any inscriptions left on it. Uh, her, her tomb, by the way, the longest in the Valley of the Kings. But no, no, there's no inscriptions left in her tomb. It's on the base of her pe the pedestal of, the, of her obelisk at, at Karnak, and it says she did it in seven months, yeah. Impressive. It seems like basalt pounders would be more effective than dolerite, since basalt no. is harder. No, basalt isn't harder. It's dolerite is harder. Dolerite, I think, is the only mineral found in Egypt that's really harder than, uh, than the pink granite, yeah. Um, Mary's asking, Cleopatra's needle is covered with inscriptions. Aren't they significant? Nope, just the names of the pharaohs. That's all they have. All, all of the, for example, Cleopatra's needle, the two say that were at Alexandria, those two just have the names of Tutmosis III and his titles. That's all. Nothing interesting. Because you had all the walls of the temples to put all interesting inscriptions on the pylons with that they stood in front of. Those have much more interesting historical inscriptions. For example, at Luxor Temple, you know, we have we had Ramses II obelisk, which aren't particularly interesting, but right behind them is the scene of the Battle of Kadesh, Ramses' great battle. So the walls of the temples always have the historical interesting inscriptions, not the obelisks. Um, Pauline is asking. Um, were other obelisks done by other civilizations? Hmm. Not really. I don't. I think Egypt is the only one. Um, partly because Egypt had the granite. You need granite for tall obelisks. You do. Um, but also, I think Egypt was the builders. They were the builders. So no, it's a purely Egyptian thing. Obelisks are something that's purely Egyptian. Um, someone is asking, what is the reason behind the interest of set of countries to erect these obelisks on their territory, ideologic or cultural? I think it's certainly cultural. Um, certainly for the, for the Romans, it was a sign of domination over Egypt. They're bringing back these obelisks as kind of um, war trophies. But for example, in Paris, I mean, why does Paris want one? Why does the New York want one? Um, I think it's a kind of uh, status symbol of having something from this great ancient civilization in your country. And I think that's why, in the same way that museums love to have Egyptian exhibitions, there's a kind of status of associating yourself with this great ancient civilization. So I think it's a kind of a little bit of envy, maybe a little bit of um, reverence for another civilization. Um, Libby is asking, do you think space archaeologists like Sarah Farkas could contribute to finding lost obelisks as well as new sites in general? Well, I, th I think, for example, I mean, if, you, if you're thinking about the satellite archaeology and things like that, absolutely, it's, it's been crucial um, in many countries, not so much for Egypt. E it's very helpful for Egypt, but other countries like Amazon jungle, where you can't see anything from the ground, but from space, you can see it. I think it's very, very helpful. It's a wonderful technique. It is. I mean, it's helped in Egypt, for example, already locating meteor sites where, where meteorites crashed into, into the, the southwestern part of the desert, things like that. Um, yeah, it's very, very helpful. Um, is there any information about the first and the last obelisk that the Egyptian built? Interesting. Um, I'm, I'm not even sure what the first obelisk is. Um, obel small obelisks, you know, you know, originally in the Old Kingdom, there was a stone called the Benben, -ben, which is sort of a tall stone with rounded on top, a little bit like a stella that was sort of worshiped, the Ben Ben stone. And that may be the precursor of the obelisk. That may be the first obelisk. But in the middle 
Middle Kingdom, we start to get the big obelisks. We get a few big obelisks in the Middle Kingdom. So those are the first really big ones. Um, and the last ones, I'm trying to think who would, who would be the last big obelisks. Um, the Ptolemies didn't erect obelisks. I think they, they couldn't do it. Um, so it's probably the New Kingdom ones around the time of Ramses. Yeah. Yeah, George is asking, has anyone excavated underneath the Luxor pedestal to see if any deposits were left underneath? No, very nice question. Um, the answer is no. No, they haven't excavated under the pedestal. Um, it's a little bit hard to do that kind of excavation because it'll shift and things like that. But when they built the temple, the Egyptians, when they built the temple, they usually put foundation deposits, little amulets and things to, to, to ensure that the, there would be a successful building of the temple. They did it at the four corners and <coughs> don't see any on obelisk, but maybe they're there. Uh, Ahmed Siddi is asking, did Hatshepsut break the rules by showing how the obelisks were moved? I don't think she broke a rule by showing how they were, were used. I think the Egyptians were so used, to, <coughs> excuse me, the Egyptians were so used to doing it that it's almost like they didn't have to show you. You know, people could see a barge coming down the Nile with two obelisks on it. Everybody sort of knew, but she was very proud of it. So she put it down. I don't think she broke the rules. I don't think it was kept secret by any means. I think everybody could see how it was done, but it just wasn't worth mentioning almost. It was so commonplace for the Egyptians. Okay. Yeah. But uh, he's containing the question, but that was the first time depicted, depicted the, the, how it was raised. It's the only time that we have of an obelisk being moved. It's the only one in all of Egyptian history. We don't have anything showing an obelisk being erected. We don't have anything like that. The last one, I hope. Okay. Uh, can a new obelisk slide it along a passage cut in front of it? This would avoid lifting the entire new block. I think you to think about the unfinished obelisk. Could it just, just be slid that way? But the problem is there's a whole wall of the quarry all around the obelisk. I don't think it could just slide out that way. Um, you'd have to take down a lot of quarry. So that's a real problem still. Okay, uh, Claudia had a, a comment basically. Ahead, so the Romans are actually the original engineers and Leba just modernized it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Good. Claudia. Okay, uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Breyer for the wonderful talk. And we always enjoy having you discussing uh, the book and hopefully in the future, uh, your upcoming book. I just wanted to ask you, what is your future projects uh, with AUC Press? <laughs> well, with AUC Press, I do have another book coming out. I, I don't, I'm not sure exactly when it's gonna come out. It's another translation um, that my, my friend Colette and I did together. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a classic. It's, it's something that is very famous, has never been translated, but I won't tell you what it is. <laughs> That's a secret. We'll tune yeah. I'm sure we're going to have another talk uh, when the book is out. I uh, just want to say that the book is available uh, for purchase uh, through uh, on online uh, book retailers like Amazon and shop.org. I just pasted in the chat box the links to purchase. And uh, the book is also available uh, worldwide and uh, in Egypt yeah. through AC bookstores and the way in Egypt. Yeah, it's a beautiful um, book. Thank you so much. I should add, it's a beautiful book. AUC Press did a wonderful job on it. I mean, they really spared no expense. They have Labaz diagrams and everything. So I'm really happy with the way AUC Press did it. It's wonderful. We're glad to hear that. Uh, the copy is available uh, right behind your back, by the way, if you, can, oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> if you can see it. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for your time. And, Pleasure. Uh, the, the recording of the lecture is going to be available on our mm -hmm. Facebook page and YouTube channel uh, the next coming hours. We thank you so much for sharing for meeting with us and thank you so much Dr. Bai for your time and everyone for your questions you made this a very wonderful uh, event bye everybody thank you bye, everyone bye bye have a lovely rest of the day